Hello and welcome to the Headache Doctor Podcast. I'm Dr. Taves and it's my mission to empower everyone with headaches and migraines to break free from a life of fear and dependence and thrive in everything you do. And in today's podcast, we're going to talk about the difference between headaches and migraines and why that even matters. This is a, a hot topic. It's, it's something that as you are uh, suffering with headaches and migraines and in our healthcare system people long for a diagnosis they long to know that there is a name to something that that they're dealing with and that that diagnosis then can then lead to the proper type of intervention or the proper treatment and so getting the diagnosis right is important for treatment but it's also valuable for you that uh, for you the patient because you have a way to uh, describe or uh, talk about what you're what you're feeling Um, and it makes you feel heard and understood and so um, it's important to 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 understand um, the difference between headaches and migraines uh, for that reason but it's also important to understand that um, whether you have a headache or a migraine um, in our healthcare system if we get too attached to one of those diagnoses, it can actually uh, there there can be some things that uh, may actually harm or prevent you from getting proper treatment. But in today's episode, we're just going to talk about the difference between a headache and a migraine, um, what I've seen in my practice, where where those diagnoses are coming from within the traditional Western medicine model, and uh, what that means for you. So let's start with migraine because if we di- if we describe and accurately can um, <clears throat> diagnose a migraine, um, then we we can categorize headaches. Now, I want to start with what how Western medicine and how the medical doctors have uh, studied, what they've found with those studies, and how that has led to them describing a migraine. So, if we, if we look back in the sort of history of of migraines and what Western medicine has done to um, to help this type of a patient and and to research what the underlying cause is uh, traditionally and there are still many providers that would hold this uh, perspective but traditionally it was thought to be a vascular problem when I say a vascular problem I'm talking about blood vessels uh, specifically in the head so these blood vessels are um, running through what's called your dura. Um, the dura is a, is a type of tissue that sort of surrounds your central nervous system. It uh, encapsulates the, the brain itself, the brain tissue, uh, those neurons, and, and there's blood vessels that run through the dura. And the thought was that because patients present with a, a pounding sensation, almost like they can feel their pulse, and it's, it's painful pulsing, they assume that the the blood vessels are involved and that's um, that's actually a, a fair assumption and I'm not actually saying that the that pain is is uh, separate from the pulsating uh, that is uh, running through the blood vessels but the the blood vessels themselves were assumed to be the problem they went down this road even further because what they did was prescribe Uh, blood pressure medications that resulted in a reduction in frequency and intensity of uh, migraine. So propanolol is one of those drugs. If uh, you're listening to this and you're a chronic migraine sufferer, you may have been prescribed a daily medication called propanolol. Uh, Now propanolol is, like I said, it's mainly a a heart uh, blood pressure type medication it oftentimes is prescribed by the neurologist if you also have high blood pressure um, if you've had any sort of like let's say cardiac event um, and you have migraines uh, it doesn't have to be connected to a a second diagnosis but when I've been uh, discussing uh, migraine cases with neurologists oftentimes um, they will They'll tell me that they'll prescribe a propanolol if there's sort of a, a second diagnosis that the patient has that propanolol can then help with. And so we have this pulsating, pulsating sensation. We have a propanolol, which helps um, reduce 
the uh, frequency and intensity, and, and there are other types, but that's one of the more common ones that I see prescribed. And uh, so why would propanolol work um, if this wasn't a, a blood pressure uh, vascular problem? Um, and so that's, uh, that's the conclusion that uh, Western medicine has come to, that these uh, medical doctors have, have found. Uh, now they're they're using these these correlations. They're using the the fact that <clears throat> uh, the symptoms present as pulsating, uh, and that an intervention that's in actually uh, changing the amount of tension um, or the amount of dilation is what it's called. It's changing the blood pressure um, through uh, the vascular system in the head um, helps. Okay, and so it's reasonable to conclude that this is a blood pressure problem. Um, and with that, the neck would not even be considered. So it's kind of like, well, we've we've found uh, a reasonable explanation for migraines. We we've found a reasonable uh, solution in these medications, and so we're that's that's where our research is going to continue. We're not going to uh, assume it's a neck problem because uh, if we can change um, the the vasculature, what the what the blood vessel itself. Uh, experiences and that helps then why would the neck be involved at all it, it doesn't make any intuitive sense um, to have the neck be involved uh, okay so that's that's kind of historically what has been thought now um, if we fast forward there's a lot of data kind of more research coming out because um, partially driven by uh, the types of medications um, that have come out recently one of them being this uh, CGRP type drug and essentially uh, what that is doing is is it's preventing a protein from being transmitted and and that protein is involved in the pain signaling process and we're seeing that that specific protein is more common in patients that suffer with migraines uh, but it's not exclusive to patients that suffer with migraines because it also happens to be present with uh, hip pain and, and other types of pain within the body, this specific protein is, is used. And so the medication, um, there's are usually injectables about once per month uh, that patients are trialing and, and that you'll see advertisements for, like at the Super Bowl or wherever. Um, and these, these um, women that are super happy because you know they're, uh, re they've seen a reduction in their, in their migraine frequency or intensity. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but um, it also, is sort of leading them to conclude that oh here's the answer it's it's this type of protein and it's this pain pathway and this is why migraines exist um, but if you look at the the and actually it's on like if you look at Amovig or Amgality or Ajovi it's on their home page that it'll claim 40 50 percent reduction in, in about half of the people that take it so if it were truly the solution it why would not everyone um, find relief for at least you know 90 percent of people um, and so that is another sort of uh, path of uh, explanation that uh, the neurology field has gone down another one that they've seen is this uh, court of it's called cortical slowing um, cortical depression and so they take a they take someone that's actively having a migraine and they look at their uh, brain activity. So how active are their neurons? What is their brain doing? Um, it, uh, and, and, and what they're seeing is um, the actual like um, transmission or activity level in, in the neurons in the brain and it kind of slows uh, as they're experiencing a migraine. And so the thought is, is this is sort of a, a chemical process or a neurological process that um, is happening and so the reasonable explanation would be to provide um, some sort of chemical pharmaceutical intervention to prevent that process from even happening, to prevent the nervous system from having this sort of cortical depression that they see um, with, with someone who's actively having a migraine. And so that's um, where the, you know, the, the latest and greatest sort of research has been and um, they still can't claim that they know what is happening or why it's happening but it, it's just sort of this they're revealing different things that happen during a migraine um, and so when I talk about the neck being the solution that's why 
Um, occasionally, neurologists will get all up in arms and they'll say, how could that possibly be? You don't understand what's happening. You're not a neurologist. Um, you didn't have this training. You don't understand the central nervous system or the vasculature or how could these other symptoms be explained by this? And they have all these sort of like objections to this being a neck problem. Now, let's just say that uh, it's not a neck problem and I'm crazy and uh, they're right. Uh, what what that would mean is that I, I'm dedicating my career, I'm talking about this on a podcast, and I'm treating people that have migraines, um, and they're getting better, but that ha but it would have um, nothing to do with their neck, even though that's all I'm doing is I'm treating the neck. Um, so what what I've done is I have, through through experience, and then also through reading the research and realizing that they don't have a good answer, um, I've found myself uh, coming up with very reasonable explanations for how patients experience um, their migraines. Um, and I do believe migraines are stemming from the neck. I don't think migraines are separate from this neck problem that we're discussing. And I think that those, uh, those research studies and what they found can actually have a reasonable explanation and still be sourced back to the neck. Um, and so what I'm saying is, my practice, my, my commitment in my career to help patients with headaches and migraines would make zero sense. I would be a lunatic. I would be crazy um, if this truly wasn't a neck problem. Um, and the only reason that I am so passionate about this is because there are hundreds of patients that I have helped that neurologists and the medication could not help at all. Now, if these neurologists or, or um, anyone, really, if anyone is going to object to this being a neck problem, um, I, I don't quite understand sort of the uh, pushback that um, some will have against this, at least exploring the neck as the source of pain. Um, a few reasons for that. Neck pain is, if I, if I remember correctly, um, is... One of the more common, well, I do know this, it's one of the more commonly experienced uh, symptoms associated with migraines. And so we think of migraines as having this one-sided pulsating throbbing sensation that's debilitating, and it's associated with sensitivities to lights and sounds, a visual disturbance, things like that. Well, what they don't use to diagnose migraines is, an, is neck pain, but it's actually very, very commonly associated with migraines, um, just as commonly associated uh, as the sensitivity to lights and sounds and the visual disturbance. And so these patients are having neck pain. So a lot of people with migraines intuitively know that their neck hurts, that their, their neck, uh, there's something wrong with their neck. And oftentimes migraines will come about after a car accident or, or some sort of head or neck trauma. So it's intuitive to the patient. And it's frustrating to these patients when they go to the neurologist and, and the neurologist just kind of dismisses their neck as the problem because the x-ray is fine or the CT scan fine or the MRI is fine. So um, that's, that's the first thing is that it is intuitive for many patients with migraines and so the patient themselves can kind of testify to this. It's like, oh, I feel like there's something that's missed. The neck is not being looked at properly or no one's really treated the neck. The other thing, my objection to, to this pushback as migraines being a neck problem is that what I do um, essentially has zero side effects. There's, it's very safe. Um, the, the side effect that you may experience as I'm working with someone is soreness. Now, someone who's dealing with migraines I would hope is going to be okay with risking soreness for the sake of benefiting their entire life of getting rid of migraines, which is a debilitating pain already. I've never had anyone tell me that the soreness related to treatment was worse than their migraines. It just has not happened. Um, and so if the only side effect uh, from what I do is soreness, then why not at least take the risk? Why not try? And when I say try, I'm not talking about I take you through this extensive program that um, never ends um, and it's just dragging you on and, and pulling on your uh, sort of emotional um, triggers and it's draining. I'm talking about like, let's just try two or three visits um, and, and we'll keep sort of a, um, a conservative or, you know, an appropriate um, perspective on, on what the outcome might be. And after a couple, three visits, um, if your neck truly isn't the problem, if you're not seeing any benefits, um, if, if you, the patient, feel like, yeah, this is totally not it, then, then that's fine. Like we tried, at least we can kind of check that box and move on. 
Now I will tell you that very, 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 very rarely does that happen. Even with the most stubborn migraine patients, not, no, it's not, I'm not talking about stubborn in their personality, I'm talking about their symptoms being stubborn. Even those situations, the patients know that their neck is the problem. They, they feel it when I work on them. And they, they even can feel like, yeah, this is getting at the right spot. It's just stubborn. It's not moving. It's been there for a while. My body's just sort of adapted to this, this new normal pain. Um, and so they will persevere. Um, and, and they'll want their neck to be addressed. So those are my two things. Even without showing um, the research that, that uh, has been done, that I've found, that I've used to um, sort of build my practice around and justify my reasoning, and even if we um, don't talk about all the great success stories I have or all the patient testimonies, um, the, the two things I would rest on is that one, I would bet you that 80% of people with migraines intuitively just know that their neck could be the problem. And two, migraines are so debilitating, what I do has almost no side effects, so why not at least try, instead of just continuing down this road of medication, um, that gives even the latest and greatest, only give uh, a possible reduction of 50% and 50% of people. Okay. So what is a migraine? A migraine is a one-sided pulsating sensation that uh, is associated with light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, a visual disturbance. Uh, oftentimes that's described as, like, as an aura that's a precursor to the actual migraine symptoms. Um, migraines have different classifications, but that pain is usually one of the telltale signs of that debilitating, excruciating pain. Um, sometimes it, patients can have atypical migraines where they just have uh, dizziness uh, or nausea or, or light sensitivities, visual disturbances without uh, so much the pain. And I've kind of seen all of those different categories uh, of migraines. And so it was believed to be uh, vascular and now they're thinking it's more of a chemical process. The new medications are shutting off a protein that's transmitting the pain signal to the brain. Um, and that's kind of the way the, the medical field has gone. So, and what I do with, with the neck problem being this uh, primary um, intervention, I, I'm working on the neck. I'm trying to restore movement to the neck. There's these joints in the upper part of the neck that are not moving and they're being overlooked. They're not seen on MRI or CT scan. So what's happening there in brief, uh, the neck is, is ultimately sending the pain signal the brain realizes that pain. Now what happens between the neck and the brain is that it meets up in the brainstem with other sensory nerves. It meets up in a nucleus called the trigeminal cervical nucleus. And that nucleus is actually receiving signals, uh, sensory input from the head and the face. And so the brain is getting this pain signal and it's kind of like you know, you, you've got this flow of traffic and all these side roads are diverging onto the main highway traffic. And then you're, you're like pointing out a car and saying, where did that come from? You're like, I have no idea. I, I do know that uh, within the last five miles, there's these exits. So I'm going to guess it came from one of these areas. Um, that's not a perfect example, but essentially that's what the brain is doing. It's trying to figure out where the pain is coming from. And when the pain is severe enough, it uh, oftentimes will get it wrong. So sometimes patients don't even have neck pain. It's just pain behind their eye or kind of wrapping up and around their head or in their forehead. And it's still a neck problem, but the brain is perceiving it as coming from the head or the face. Now, when the pain is severe enough, that's when you get into this confusion or hypersensitivity with other sensory inputs. So the brain is receiving a sensory input. It's an extreme sensory input. It's kind of like flooding the brain with like, ouch, 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 it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And so what happens is the brain actually becomes hypersensitive to lights, uh, to smells, to sounds, and you, you can have a visual disturbance. And it's really just the, the perception that is changing. And the reason I can have confidence in saying that is because you can go see uh, the world's best ophthalmologist and he can do all the imaging and he, he's likely not gonna find anything wrong with your eye. You can see the world's best ENT and he's likely not going to find anything with your sinuses and you can see the world's best neurologist and he's likely not going to find anything wrong with your brain. So there's nothing 
wrong with these systems. It's just how the brain is perceiving them because it's getting such an intense pain signal. It pulls in all these other symptoms. Okay, so that's my explanation. Um, that is something that uh, neurologists have not have not connected. Um, they use those other symptoms to say it can never be a neck problem. But I'll tell you right now, I've seen all those symptoms. Most of my patients have those other symptoms. What I'm saying is they have the sen the sensitivities, the lights and sounds. They have the aura. Um, and, and they get better. Those go away, and I don't do anything with the brain. I don't do anything with the vascular system. All I'm doing is working on the neck. So to me, I think that's pretty strong evidence to say there's something here, and we should explore that. All right, so that's that's migraine. Let's talk about headache real quick. So headaches are um, classified as, as anything that's um, sort of well, if you take migraines, and that's the debilitating one-sided pain that's throbbing associated with those other uh, symptoms, a headache would just be any sort of head um, head pain, facial pain. So a headache can be a tension headache where it's more on the forehead and it, it feels like a band like strapped around your forehead. Um, a headache can be, they, uh, they actually do have a classification of what's called a cervicogenic headache, which I think encompasses a lot more types of headaches and it's uh, in the medical world it's not really um, understood that well but a cervicogenic headache starts in the, in the neck and it kind of wraps up and around in a ram's horn presentation um, so a headache can be uh, really any other head or facial pain that's not associated with uh, the sensitivities the lights and sounds or the visual disturbance um, so i'm just going to leave headache as that it's like if you have head or facial pain it's it's just that that would be a headache a different type of headache there's all different types of diagnoses um, but let me let me finish with saying that I, what i want you the listener to understand is that any head or facial pain um, should be seen as a neck problem because that's the most likely scenario is that the neck's the issue and the brain is per realizing um, it as a head or facial pain and I'm not saying there's no other reason for head or facial pain. There are other reasons. But the most likely scenario is that it's your neck. And the neck is overlooked nearly every time. Um, and so we need to backtrack, look at the neck. I, it doesn't really matter to me how your pain presents. Um, if you have been suffering and have not, and you don't have an answer to why your head or your face hurts, uh, then you need to have your neck looked at. I'm going to assume it's a neck problem without even talking to you. I'm going to say that your your neck is likely going to be the pain source, especially if they haven't found um, any other reason to explain that. And so the diagnosis that you receive, don't rely too heavily on that because people with migraines um, are going to be told by the primary care doctor or the neurologist that really it just it, we have to manage it through medication because this is a chemical process this is a vascular problem um, but I don't want you to rely on that because uh, medicine and the research they've done tells them they can't rely on that and so they might be, not be telling you that they, they might not be revealing that they don't know the answer um, but in all reality they don't they can't be confident with that because it's a correlation and it does not show cause it does not show the cause of those symptoms and so taking the medication is fine those are interventions that we can try and can be helpful for a lot of people um, but if you truly want to get to the source of the pain um, oftentimes most of the time we're going to be looking at the neck and when it when it comes to looking at the neck I've talked about this before, but that diagnosis process has to be specific to the upper part of the neck, specific to movement, and then you have to find uh, a physical therapist or someone who can manually work on uh, your neck, so using their hands. Um, and I, I work with people virtually as well, so I know that I can't physically be with everyone that has this problem across the country because people reach out from all over. And so if you're listening to this, and you, and you want this type of treatment, and what I say resonates with you, but you do not live in Colorado or can't necessarily come out to see me, uh, book a virtual visit on my website, and, and I can kind of walk you through everything to do at home. And, uh, and, and we can, I've seen that be very, very helpful for people um, that I've worked with. And so that can be a good option. I can also help you sort of navigate the healthcare system, know what to look for, that type of thing. So that's, that's the difference between a headache and a migraine. Uh, if you're a neurologist listening to this and you are like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, I would love to know about it. 
uh, if you think I'm, I'm crazy, uh, I, would, I would love to know that too and, and uh, try to convince you otherwise. Um, but if you're a patient listening to this, I hope that this gives you um, hope. I ho- um, I'm, I'm looking for that sort of, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Now I can move forward. Now I can kind of pursue this as a neck problem. And then you're on your way to finding relief. Again, this is the Headache Doctor Podcast. I'm Dr. Taves. I appreciate all of you, my listeners, and I hope that you guys are encouraged and able to to share this information with everyone else. So not only you feel empowered um, and and freed up to to live your life the way you want, but you can empower others. Uh, Thanks for listening.